Come out with us and play Love Your London. Have a banana. In today's episode of Love Your London, we take you on a tour of Duncan Terrace, Colebrook Row and the streets just off it, where the famous essayist Charles Lamb used to live with his mother-killing sister, where an evil Portuguese nobleman used to starve animals to death, where one of the 20th century's most celebrated playwrights was murdered by his partner, a Scotsman who hated the number 45 200 years before an Englishman was very enthusiastic about the number 42, who lived on the same street as another Englishman who liked flying around his own house literally. Music lovers rejoice. There'll be stuff about the Beatles, the Kinks, and the Clash too. Yes, today's episode is all about the many eccentrics who lived within this very small area. But first, let us show you what the area looks like. This is Duncan Terrace Gardens. Now this is actually the course of something called the New River. There is a river running underneath us called the New River. Um, it's culverted, as you can see. Um, we will actually be looking in a, in a later episode in this series at a little part of the New River, uh, the New River Walk, uh, which, um, is, uh, which is open still to the public, to the elements. It's a lovely little walk, uh, just up there. We won't be seeing it in this episode. But this is, these are the gardens, Duncan Terrace Gardens. The man-made river um, dates from 1613 um, and it was um, to bring uh, drinking water down from London from the River Lee, which is about some 45 kilometres away from here, to the north. Um, so, so the River Lee to the part. It's, a river, it's, where, the, it's where the Chadwell um, and Anwell Springs are, um, uh, part of the River Lee. Um, and in fact, Queen Elizabeth I um, realised that London needs drinking water, so, so she said, that she gave permission for a new river to be built to bring drinking water to London. It took quite a long time for someone to actually uh, decide to do that. Yeah, in 1609, that person was Hugh Middleton, who was a Welsh goldsmith, and he persuaded the powers that be that he was the person to do it. Um, so he did. It was actually a huge struggle. Um, uh, because there were so many greedy landowners um, who were arguing uh, that the river was going to be passing through uh, their land. Uh, but he managed to persuade them. In 1609 he bought the river here and in 1613 is when this new river was unveiled to the public. Um, and Hugh's brother, Thomas, was actually the, the Lord Mayor at the time. Uh, it, was his, it was the first year that he was Lord Mayor in 1613. So what a great year for the Middletons that was. Hugh became a, a hero, uh, bringing, the, um, bringing the river to, uh, drinking water down here to London, and his mayor brother was here to, uh, uh, to add the inauguration ceremony. You'll, you'll, see, you'll see the Middleton name everywhere around here. There's Middleton squares, Middleton, Middleton places, Middleton schools, Middleton roads. Uh, there's a statue uh, in Islington Green dedicated to Hugh Middleton, uh, which we'll, you'll, you'll see now on your screen. Now, we are here at this fantastic, this fantastic tree. It's called the Spontaneous City in the Tree of Heaven. And you can see they're all the bird boxes. Bee boxes. Birds. Uh, well, the bees are the little ones. See the, over here at the top? Yeah. The tiny little double holes, those are from little Those are birds, birds and bees. Solitary bees. The birds and the bees. Um, now, there's, there are two of these. There's one here and there's one in the west of London. It's got a, 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 in, in Cremorne Gardens. Exactly the same. Uh, now, why is it called Spontaneous City in the Tree of Heaven? This tree is actually called the Tree of Heaven. It's, it comes originally from China. Its technical name is, I'm going to have to look this up, Alianthus Altissima. Now, that tree, if any of our American viewers are watching, um, probably gives them shudders of fear because in America, this is a really invasive species. It grows so easily. Um, and in fact, um, it, ke it keeps on growing. Um, it, it, um, it, 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 it basically it spores itself. It just, uh, it, once it grows, another one will grow next to it. Uh, they can go on forever. Um, uh, uh, but, the, but they're actually quite weak. So after a couple of hundred years, the, it, it, they get quite hollow inside. And so they become quite dangerous. They can fall over in very strong winds. 
um, if, when, once they get old, but they're very invasive. But interestingly, here in, here in the UK, it doesn't seem to be an invasive species. They don't sort of propagate in the same way that they do in the, in the US. Um, so Alliansis altissima. Um, another interesting thing about this tree is that um, you can make, uh, well, so there's, a, there's a variety of silkworms that actually um, eat the leaves of this tree. Um, the silk it produces is much, much stronger than, than, than mulberry tree silk, um, but it's not as shiny and it's, not as, uh, it's, it's a much coarser sort of silk, but it's very strong. Um, so another interesting, uh, interesting thing about this tree, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it, you can make silk from it. So while it's okay for, for a certain type of silkworm, you yourself shouldn't eat the leaves of this tree because there is a mild toxin in the leaves that will not make you feel very well. And behind this pale green door at number 22 Duncan Terrace, overlooking these fabulous gardens, lived Douglas Adams, author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Adams's Grade 2 listed home recently went on sale for just shy of £6 million. The road on the other side of Duncan Terrace Gardens is called Colebrook Row, and at number 20, almost opposite Douglas Adams's gaff, lived, until he moved to Downing Street, a certain Boris Johnson. He sold his Grade 2 listed property for £3.75 million. But we're not interested in Boris Johnson. There's far more interesting former residents of this neighbourhood, as we are about to find out. So I'm sure that you all know who Joe Orton was. Joe Orton was the celebrated playwright um, and uh, he, was, he lived and sadly died here on the 25 Noel Road. <sighs> here he is. Flat up there, I think that's flat number four. He wrote plays like Entertaining Mr. Sloan and Loot and lots of others. Um, he was killed in that flat uh, by his boyfriend Kenneth Halliwell, uh, who then went on to kill himself afterwards. Um, very, very sad story. Um, he was bludgeoned to death. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think Joe was going to split up with him. They've been together for years and years and years, but um, it's not really known exactly why it happened. Um, he did have, uh, Kenneth did have a, f a few um, insecurity problems of his own. If you want to know more about Joe Wharton, um, you've got to watch the amazing film with Gary Oldman playing Joe Wharton, Alfred Molina playing um, Kenneth, um, and it's called Prick Up Your Ears. Fantastic movie. Um, there's going to be a link in the description below uh, where you can uh, actually buy the DVD at a really cheap price um, at the moment. Um, you can buy it for just £4.84 using the very special link, uh, ex uh, exclusive link uh, that's in the description. And if you love Gary Oldman, I mean, and this is just like him at his best. Buying DVDs from our Amazon link is not the only way that you can support our channel. You can support us by becoming a patron via Patreon. You can share our videos on social media. And you must please, please like this video. And if you've not done so already, subscribe to our channel and ring that notification bell. Back to the video. Joe Orton in 1967, which is when he was uh, killed, uh, Joe Orton was in the process of writing a, um, a, a movie script for the Beatles. In fact, he'd finished it. Um, it was commissioned by the Beatles. He, he, he finished it. He, he gave it to Brian Epstein, the, um, the, the manager. But the manager just returned it back to him without any comments or explanation why. So basically, Brian Epstein d decided that it wasn't good enough. Uh, so, so at the time of his death, um, Joe Wharton was rewriting it, um, sort of like with with Mick Jagger um, in in one of the leading roles. Uh, it's going to be Mick Jagger and Ian McKellen, and um, he was just in the middle of, 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 of writing what could have been the most amazing film ever um, at the time of his death. It, it was, um, it was re, it was made for BBC Radio 3. Uh, they made it, they, 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 they recorded it with, I think, Prunella Scales and um, uh, Damon Alban from Blur and a few other people in it. 1967 is when he died. It must have been a terrible shock to the neighbours, uh, the very new neighbours, because um, that there is number 23. 
23, one year before the sad demise of Joe Orton, is where Ivan Vaughan lived. He had moved in with his wife in 1966, and that was his next door neighbour. Who is Ivan Vaughan, you may be asking? Ivan Vaughan was in the Quarrymen. Um, he was one of the original Quarrymen um, who uh, performed with, uh, he, was, he was a school friend of John Lennon, um, and um, he was with John Lennon uh, in the Walton um, fate um, uh, on the day that, uh, and he actually introduced John Lennon to Paul McCartney. Um, so, if it weren't for Ivan Vaughan, who lived here, um, the Beatles wouldn't have happened. So just imagine also the shock of, of, of like your neighbour dying, your famous neighbour dying. They, were cl they, were, they knew each other, of course. Obviously, they knew each other because um, he was writing a, 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 a movie for the Beatles. But um, so the Beatles never, ever forgot. Uh, they, were al they were always very, very grateful to Ivan uh, for um, bringing the Beatles together. Um, when Ivan died, unfortunately, he, he got Parkinson's. He died of pneumonia. Um, in he got he got he was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 1977, um, and he eventually died of pneumonia in 1993. When he died, Paul McCartney was absolutely gutted. He actually took up poetry, writing poetry for the first time since he was a child, and he penned a lovely poem called Ivan uh, in his honour. Yes, another beautiful thing. Ivan's wife, I think her name was Jan. Um, she was a French teacher, um, and she helped the Beatles with the lyrics to Michel, obviously the French lyrics. Michel, ma belle, c'est les mots qui vont très bien ensemble, très bien ensemble. That was written by Ivan's wife, Mich um, Jan. Uh, another last thing which I'm going to say, uh, Beatles related, um, he was a teacher, Ivan, um, and he I had this idea to set up this very hippie school um, which was going to be teaching kids but in with hippie values um, and it was called the Apple School obviously after the Apple music label uh, label and the Beatles funded it um, it didn't really work I, I think there was some sort of like uh, well it, it, it didn't really take off but um, he was under the Apple management um, so apple were it was on their payroll basically and the apple were, were um, funding the school uh, the apple school and that was he was the headmaster was ivan so wow this is beatles such an important place here for the beatles so important it, it's sort of like i got like goose goose pimples hair standing on end well maybe not on end but you know what i mean yeah so Ringo Starr put something on in this, in this church. I'm um. not entirely sure because I haven't researched this. British classical composer and conductor John Taverner recorded the album The Whale inside that church in 1970 for the Apple label. Ringo Starr was managing him at the time and he also sang and did percussion on that album. This fact is courtesy of the 384 page Ringo Starr Encyclopedia which you can purchase from our link in the description for just £3.99. Now one person who is particularly eccentric who lived down here... Eccentric. Very eccentric. This is a place of lots of eccentric people. Oh these are tea roses, Justin. Oh boy, that, that, it's, it's apricot. Peach and apricot. Sniff. Yeah, it's nice. It smells lovely. Oh, isn't it? Isn't it lovely? Yeah, it's nice. There we are. Oh boy. See, she's a beaut. Oh, oh boy. Oh, I'm not going to... Oh, did I just break that one? Right. Okay. Right, so just up here, um, I, I don't know the exact address. In fact, um, I've not been... I, I did try and find the exact address. I couldn't find it. Um, up. Up here is where John Till Allingham lived. Right. Uh, John Till Allingham, really eccentric person. He died at the, very eccentric. He died at the age of 37. His father was a wine merchant, uh, so he kind of drunk himself to death. Um, I hate it when that happens. Yes. Um, he was a he was a fantastic another fantastic playwright. I think it's sort of like in this area here. He uh, wrote some fantastic farces um, that were really, really popular. 
Um, they were on Drury Lane and stuff like that. He had obviously lots of money from his dad, who was uh, the wine merchant. Uh, he, was, he was a bit of a mechanic as well, and he was fascinating with flying machines. And he used to fly, he, he created this machine with steam and balloons and all sorts of stuff, and he used to flap around the house. Um, where, and he actually took off the ground, I believe, a couple of times. But he used to flap around the house and everything would be flying all over the place, inside his father's house, uh, just here. Um, fascinating person. Absolutely fascinating. Um, there's actually a street named after Ordingham, just around the corner, Ordingham Street. Um, we won't go there just now, but um, I'll just slip in a little bit of a Google image here, so you can see it. A little bit nervous of dogs. But no, we still haven't come to the most famous former resident of Duncan Terrace. That title goes to the brilliant essayist Charles Lamb, who lived at number 64 with his sister Mary, herself a brilliant essayist. They lived here between 1823 and 1827. Join us on the pleasant walk up to their house. So Duncan Terrace, um, this is actually an interesting place because this is where the road actually has, on the left hand side it's called Duncan Terrace and on the right hand side it's called Col Colbrook Row. Um, obviously, um, and, as, and obviously as I said before, the new river um, is running right underneath us at the moment. Uh, so number 64, we have the home of Charles and Mary Lamb. Oh hey, come to the free door. It's obviously free to take. Look, it's got all the, the door furniture. Yeah. Door I, don't, furniture. I don't suppose it came from Charles Lamb's oh, house though. No, well, they may have done actually if they put it in the front. Well it looks very like the, Well it looks new. Well relatively new, unlike that van. Yeah. Anyway, so Charles this is Colbr this is Colbrook Cottage and this is where he lived with uh, with his beloved sister Mary. The murderess. 1796 um, is when Mary bludgeoned her, their mother to death uh, in front of the whole family. Um, uh, uh, Char Char Charles ran in and took the knife out of, out of her hand. Uh, she did go briefly to an asylum, uh, but um, about f a few years later, um, Charles, you know, he, he, he took her out of the asylum oh, and like, looked after her. Yeah. Um, and, um, and he looked after her all the time, right up until he could no longer look after himself. And he very reluctantly took her from this house to um, uh, an asylum in Hackney, I believe, where she, uh, she outlived him. Uh, she, never actually, she never got over the fact that her, her, her brother died. It's very, very sad. Um, but yes, I mean, and no one, people didn't actually know about her mental health. Um, they kept it kind of secret, and 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 uh, even even the murder was like no one knew. I mean, uh, Mary herself was fated in literary circles. Uh, she was an essayist as well. I mean, just they were a fascinating family, and Charles sounded like a gem of a person, a lovely person. You may have actually noticed that on the plaque it refers to him as Charles Alia Lamb. Alia was actually Charles's nom de plume whenever he wrote for the London magazine between 1820 and 1825, actually during the period that he was living here. In fact, just around the corner is an Alia Street, and there's an Alia Muse running parallel just to the southwest of it. The fact that there's not one but two streets named after his nom de plume that he only used during three of the five years that he lived on Duncan Terrace shows you just how much local people appreciated the fact that he had called this area his home, albeit for just five short years. There's even a pub on Alia Street called the Charles Lamb. Anyway, so we're just now going to check out another place up here. You can keep it rolling actually because it's just literally around the corner. Cool. Indeed. Okay, so now we're going to walk out up here. So we're, we're continuing up Colbrook Row, Colbrook Row. Now, around about here was a very sorry sight. Around about here was a very sorry sight. Um, as, as, you, as you know, this was where the new river was. There was a very nasty person who lived here. Really, really nasty. 
a, port, a member of the Portuguese nobility. His name was Efraim Lopes Pereira d'Aguilar. Efraim Lopes Pereira d'Aguilar. A filthy, filthy rich man, but one of the biggest misers in the world. Um, this, uh, I'll, I'll put the dates up on your screen now so you can see them. Um, he uh, had a farm right here on the banks of the New River and he would starve the animals. He, 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 he had some kind of really weird sadistic thing where he would starve the animals pretty much to death, well to death. Uh, everyone called it the starvation farm because it was in it was everyone could see it I mean it was like full of emaciated cattle and sheep eating e eating one another because they'd end up uh, eating one another to stay alive now he was absolutely filthy rich he was a Freemason uh, he uh, had he had so much money when, when when he died his daughters found hidden in his house two hundred thousand uh, pounds two hundred thousand pounds in today's money is about 20 million pounds he started his, his wife was uh, uh was physically abused and he would starve her she did manage to get away at some point uh, that was the second wife i think the first the first wife died the second wife almost died probably fed her to the sheep as well <laughs> absolutely horrible um but the fact but the uh, thing is i mean he, he did actually he, he was known as a philanthropist he, he would give money to local orphanages uh, but yes yeah, so this was this was a location of starvation farm that was a, that was the name that everyone gave it uh really sad horrible story i know but <laughs> we've had a couple of horrible stories like poor old joe orton and uh, starvation farm guy but we've had some really nice happy stories as well all right so and speaking of happy stories i think it's time for please go to jab number two yes i'm having my jab please go here in the jab number two in the angel business design jab center number two please number two so i left sharon with the important task of nursing our pints in the beer garden of the camden head pub whilst i went off to get my second moderna jab which i'd conveniently arranged to take place at angel on the day that we were filming please don't go anywhere because in this episode i will be telling you about why the camden head is so important to the kinks talking to one of the locals about chris farlow and the clash and we're even going to be talking about how important the area is to the history of the sex Crystals. Plus, don't forget that we're going to tell you about the most eccentric local of them all, a Scotsman who lived on Camden Passage and who had a hatred for the number 45. So please don't go away. Remember to like this video and hang in there. The vaccination process went smoothly, no queue, got seen almost instantly, got jabbed by a guy called Harvey, waited my 15 minutes in case I had a funny turn, and then made my way back to the Camden Head in order to fulfil my other duty, namely to entertain you and to inform you about all things Islington. Okay, I've left Sharon in the Camden Head. Camden Head's a lovely old pub. Um, it's uh, another pub with a strong musical history. Thank you very much. Okay. Somebody's got a double dose. Yeah. Double, double, double dose. You've joined our club. You've joined our Hellish Crusade. Yes. So this is a place where the Kinks used to rehearse. Um, and as I, and uh, Brian Epstein actually came here on the 26th of September 1963. He came here to see them, uh, to see them rehearse. Um, and um, he actually wasn't that impressed, so he left. So this is actually where Mick Avery, the drummer of the Kinks, um, audition was auditioned. And after the previous drummer, Mickey Willett, left. Um, he came and, um, and of course, he is part of Kink's history. Um, after he left, he, he took over the drumming duties. He was uh, very close to Ray Davis. Wasn't that close to Dave, unfortunately. There, there was a little bit of a uh, friction between them. But, yep, yeah, this is it. This is where, uh, and uh, this is where, and he's still, still around today, to this day. This is where the Kink's final piece of the jigsaw happened. Actually, uh, Mick Avery was very, very close to joining the Rolling Stones. He was in the Bricklayer's Arms uh, in 1961 and rehearsed for them as well. He, I think he had two gigs with them. Um, 
But uh, and this was this was before the Rolling Stones were the Rolling Stones. Uh, Bricklayer's Arms in Broadwick Street in Soho, no longer there unfortunately. Um, so yeah, he could have been a Rolling Stone, um, uh, but he no, he, he turned out to be a kink after all. Do you know where's the, where's the stage? When they have music here, where, where was the stage? Upstairs. It was upstairs? Yeah. Because the Kinks played here. No, this is the Kinks. You know the Kinks? The yeah. band called the Kinks? Oh, it's where... That's right. The Kinks is back. Yes, he was upstairs. He was upstairs. Long time ago, yeah. Long time ago, 1963. 1963? Yeah, 23rd of September, I think it was. I think you also used to be upstairs with uh, the Carol crew. With well, Kenneth Williams with the band and a couple of other characters. And they used to meet upstairs. They used to meet upstairs. But anyway, but it's only, I heard this from a, a young chap, well, he's well, it's my age now. It's, he's, he was a young chap at the time, in the 70s. His parents used to run the pub. And he told me how they used to meet up and he used to go upstairs because it's the only place where they could be alone. Yes. In, uh, yeah, upstairs. Upstairs, yeah. I was saying, imagine the Pinks practicing up here. He mentioned the Pinks as well. Yeah. I was there at the time. Yeah? No, yeah, oh, it would be cool. amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Love to see that. Mm. Yeah, because uh, this is where um, Mick Avery, the, the drummer, uh, rehearsed for the Kinks for the first time and they, they, he joined them. Because uh, Mick Willett, the previous drummer, Mick Willett, left. Right. And uh, Avery rehearsed here and, and um, joined the Kinks. Mm. Like, oh, interesting. Because I'll tell you one person I do know, and you probably, you probably know as well, is, um, you've heard of Chris Farlow. Yes, of course, yes. He, he had the antique shop opposite. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Courtois Arms, just there. Yes. He still pops into my shop because I do Militarian. He has a Militarian shop. He used to do Militarian. Yes. So I still keep in touch. I saw him on Saturday. Yes. So he's still around. He's, he knows. He's, he's, he's still around. He must be in his late 70s now, I think, or 80 or something, I suppose. Because he, um, he's the one who loaned out the costumes to uh, the Clash. Uh, for the 1980 video, Did he? Uh, for one bet for um, the call up, you know the call up song by the Clash about the anti-war song, um, and he lent them gas masks and, and sort of like um, oh, right. and, uh, and and batons and police helmets and stuff for, for the video, the call up, um, and he was based over there. So he, he, he closed that and he moved to another shop, didn't he? Called um, named after one after his song. What's his, what's his big song? Out of time. Out of time. We had the we had the shop built to arms across the road. Yeah. Which is and then after that was Reckless Records. And now it's the Euphorium Bakery. And now it's the Euphorium Bakery. That's because he had a paratroop in the window, a German paratroop. Uh, yeah. Just like uh, I think some uh, MP yes. two or something like that, machine gun. As a kid, as it's probably what got me sort of stuck in my head there, that's probably what got me doing military. So you got a, you you run the other military military place on this on uh, down, down here, yeah. Can the best guys pass it any time? still comes down. Because he's still got an interest in military action. I'm going to let you know. So thank you. Oh, I'll be in a couple in, probably in a couple of weeks, so yes. I'll let you know. Yeah, Lovely. Yeah, cool. There you go. That was, that was very serendipitous, wasn't it? Uh, managed to bump, bump into someone in the pub who runs um, a military um, memorabilia place. Um, and yeah, um, on opposite this place, there's another memorabilia place. I came to the toilet, I probably will stop filming right now. Oh, it's so cool! So cool! Yay! That was really interesting. I, 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 well, no, no, I uh, bumped into someone. Yeah, so he, so he had a shop uh, called um, uh, called to Arms as a memorabilia shop, um, and um, and that's actually what inspired the chap I just spoke to now, Lindsay, uh, to open a memorabilia shop of his own. So there was this German paratrooper outfit um, in in the window, uh, like a model. Um, yeah. So uh, basically, it's now unfortunately it's now a coffee shop, a patisserie called Euphoria. Um, but um, Chris did go on then to open a new place called um, Out of Time, um, named obviously after his, 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 his famous song. Um, and uh, he knows him, so they're mates. So, wow, fantastic. That's the sort of people that you bump into in the pub. And 
happened right next door to what is now the Euphorium Patisserie, which, as I said, used to be the Call to Arms Militaria shop run by Chris Farlow, is what is now the Screen on the Green Cinema, a venue of extreme relevance to fans of not just The Clash, but also to fans of The Sex Pistols and even of Spandau Ballet. So that cinema is really, really important for fans of The Clash. There was an amazing gig that was held there on the 27th of August, um, 1976, I think it was. It was the third gig of The Clash. They were there with the, with the Buzzcocks supporting the Sex Pistols. I'd love to have been there that night. It was basically, it was an event to promote, to promote the Sex Pistols. It's not the only time that the Sex Pistols actually played there. After Glenn Matlock was thrown out of the Sex Pistols for liking the Beatles, um, this was the very first gig uh, that um, Sid Vicious played with, with them. So this was, this, was, uh, this was the very first Sex Pistols gig with, with Sid Vicious was held there. So that was a, that was a subsequent gig. So um, at that particular gig, Gary Kemp from Spandau Ballet was in the audience and he decided to form a band based on the energy that he saw by seeing the Sex Pistols um, in there uh, with Sid Vicious, um, that gig. So yeah, well, I mean, both fantastic gigs. I'd have loved to have been there, can you just imagine? Anyway, we've got a couple of things to look at over here. There used to be many more antiques here. Um, just trying to find, oh, 41, here it is. This chap up here, Alexander Cruden, 16, 1699 to 1770. There you go. I mean, we, 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 we've spoken about a few eccentrics. This guy is the most eccentric person that you're ever going to hear about. He, is, he was from Scotland. Um, he came down to London uh, in his early 20s. He was let down in love, and as a result, he ended up going a little bit doolally. Now he lived here, he actually died here as well. He was found by his landlady in a prayer-like position. He was a strong believer in prison reform, which is really good, but he was quite an odd fellow. He wrote something called a concordance. He wrote a concordance of the Bible. Now concordance, if you don't know what that means, is basically a list of every single word that appears in a book, in this case the Bible, um, with where it, with with how that word is in context. So every single word in the Bible, you look it up and it will say every you know like not not just like the big words, but you know the as's and the ins and the and the ofs and whatever. It will be listed there. So no one until the day of computerisation today has anyone produced such a detailed and accurate concordance. Uh, now it's quite easy to, to do on the internet, but back then it was all done by hand. He worked on it for years and years, and he gave the first edition to Queen Caroline, who was uh, George II's wife, but she, day, she died a couple of days later, and she never got round to paying him. So he did the second edition and gave it to George III, um, who, um, as you know, is, is um, like, um, like uh, Alexander Crudden's, his mental health uh, was a little bit unstable at times. Um, that's well documented. Uh, King George, though, did give him a hundred pounds, which isn't too bad. It's about twenty-two thousand pounds in today's money. Um, but he did actually, Alexander did actually make quite a lot of money from the third edition. Uh, but basically, Alexander Cruden, his big aim was to be get recognition. He was all about recognition. He wanted to be knighted. Um, he did get sort of like an honorary title of bookseller to the Queen, but he wanted to be knighted. Um, and not getting knighted, he in the end he invented a title for himself, which was Alexander the Corrector. Um, he was a gifted, obviously very gifted, proofreader, um, and he went everywhere correcting any graffiti that he found. He would carry a sponge with him, uh, and any any misspellings, graffiti, signs, grocers, signs, whatever that he saw, he would get the sponge and he'd make a correction. It was uh, it was like he thought he was doing a, a huge service to the people, to the public. Uh, yeah, I suppose he was, but I suppose he's what you'd call these days a, a grammar Nazi. Apart from the fact that he hated bad grammar, which is a good thing, 
Um, he hated the number 45. Um, he had a massive problem with uh, the journalist, MP and essayist John Wilkes. John Wilkes attacked George III's speech endorsing the 1763 Paris Peace Treaty um, in issue 45 of um, the North Britain, the magazine. Um, so uh, obviously, the, obviously he, he, um, uh, Alexander was a huge defender of the, of the, of the monarchy. Uh, he thought it was all absolutely atrocious that John Wilkes should attack uh, the King's speech in issue 45. Uh, the fact that 45 was chosen was a sort of an indirect reference uh, to um, the Jacobite rising of 1745. But anyway, so he, any, if he saw the number 45, he'd scratch it out, he'd rub it out. Uh, he himself uh, lived... He himself lived at number 45 himself. Um, I'm not sure if it was 45 in his day. They may have changed the numbers. If they have changed the numbers, that is actually quite funny. The fact that he lives at number 45. But he would go round and scrub out 45 wherever he saw them. Um, and he, he was a bit of a nuisance, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so... Um, had Alexander Crutton, the corrector, been around today, he most certainly would have been, like many of his fellow Scots, extremely anti-Trump, who was, after all, the 45th President of the United States of America, in spite of the fact that Trump's mother was from Scotland. We think that the 21st century Crutton would have chuckled at Mike Mitchell's famous No 45 logo, which would have been right up his street. Sadly, he would probably also have rejoiced at the fact that a Atomic Records, the fabulous independent record shop at 6 Charlton Place, a stone's throw away from his house, which furnished local Islingtonian hipsters with countless 45s, appears to have been another victim of the pandemic. Let's hope it reopens soon. As we're in this area, I may as well just tell you briefly about the antique smell that used to be here. Yes, I remember that. Yes. I remember it very well as well. Unfortunately, as you can see, there's no one there at the moment. No, nope, it hasn't been like that for many moons, even when I, we lived up here. Uh, no, well, I mean, no. Uh, uh, it was, was still alive when I lived up here. It, yeah, when, when, we, when we lived here, it was an antiques place. Yes. Then it was taken over, I think, by uh, Superdry. Yes. Then it was taken over by Sofa.com. Yeah. Uh, so, and now it's, now it's nothing. Yeah. No, but the sad thing is... Um, there used to be 35 antique dealers here, yep. 35 independent traders, um, and um, I mean, at the time, it was quite controversial because uh, when this opened in 1980, um, I believe that some of the traders weren't too happy about it because um, they felt that it was taking people away from the small sort of shops over there, but at least it was keeping 35 independent businesses uh, in business. Yes, Sharon's very happy because uh, she picked up. <coughs> Look what she picked up. Yay. It was, uh, you know, garbage. I didn't actually pull this off a, a legitimate site. So it's just part of my street sign collection. Yep. Street sign collection. Street Don't sign become collection. a live wire. Oh, no, this is definitely, this is definitely vintage. This is definitely from like the 90s or something. It's got like, it's nice and plastic. And yes, Sharon's new sign currently takes pride of place in our garden at this very moment. Next time on Love Your London, we look for sharks in City Road Basin. We show you the outside of Kestrel House, which you may recognise from a famous album cover. And we check out not one, not two, but three local pubs. Till next time! From Acton Town to Wimbledon, from Brixton to beyond, love your London, have a banana.